Hey everybody, how you doing? Coach here. Hey, I got a little disclaimer right out of the gate here. I'm recording and uh, preparing this uh, podcast for you in the middle of a heck of a thunder and lightning storm. So if you hear it, please forgive me. I know Maestro will try to edit everything out as much as we can, but man, it's a, it's a lively one right now. Hey, welcome. I'm glad you're here. You know, uh, maybe it is actually your lawn or maybe somebody's in the neighborhood that you know about, but we all have seen them. Those freaking ugly summer lawns that just seem to fight their way through a hot summer months and look like hell doing it. They really do. They look so nice back in April, May, the first part of June. And then all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden. So what's up with that three to four months summertime lawn problems, huh? That is what we are talking about today, and that's what we're going to solve for you if it happens to apply to you. Hey, I'm glad you're here. Let's get rolling. Hey, I'm Matt. You can call me Coach. Every Friday, I bring with me landscape DIY education, concepts and theories, ideas and solutions, so you guys can go out and tackle a landscape project yourself, get professional results, save a whole lot of money in the process, and in this day and age, be a lot more self-reliant. Man, after a 20 plus year career in the green industry, I'm bringing with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I wanna share with you guys, the new modern educated self-reliant homeowner of today. Okay, listen up, because this plagues a lot of homeowners out there, it really does. And not to any fault of their own. You know, you don't know what you don't know. The solutions to these things breaks down to looking at a few problems that busy folks, maybe like yourselves, tend to overlook until it leaps out at you with obvious signs of death or distress, or the worst kind, a neighbor walking by with doggo, looks at you and go, hey dude, what the hell happened to your lawn in the past month? Yeah. As I always say, that guy syndrome rears its ugly head again. Thanks a lot, George. Hey, say hello to the missus. Thanks for noticing. Or worst yet, your spouse or partner within your own home nags you. Have you seen the lawn? What is wrong with it? And when are you going to do something about it and fix it? The neighbors are starting to talk. Nag, nag, nag. This used to be, ladies and gentlemen, when my phone used to ring. Or, when I was in the nursery business, people came in. <laughs> or people came into the nursery seeking answers and begging me, dude, please, do something to help me, would you please? <laughs> ah, yes. Summertime lawn issues, you gotta love them. Not. It usually boiled down to a few problems that would direct oneself to a probable solution. Kind of a horticultural detective type of thing. Let's talk about some of those problems that do arise in the summertime lawn care and what solutions could be formed to mitigate, prevent, or cure the issues altogether. Let's take a look at the problems. The biggest one, right out of the gate. I bet you 80% of the time, I saw this mainly from the soil and the lawn prep itself or lack thereof. I saw this mainly from builder lawns that were uh, seeded or sodded with little to no soil prep whatsoever. This uh, fastest and cheapest approach to new lawn installation was really quite common in some of the places that I practiced. They would do front yards that were, shall we say, two and three a day front yard landscaping. And they would have stacks of sod on pallets and they'd be there at seven o'clock in the morning and there was no real soil prep. The lawn bed was merely the existing soil that was there. It was lightly raked and graded with a steel tine rake and sod was slapped down on the ground, cut into pieces and everything and then sprinklers were turned on and they went to the next one. Well, the problem was is that that little half inch or maybe an inch of scratching the soil that stuff's gonna harden up fast over time. And for those who that were seeded, the same approach was applied. They would scratch, grade, throw the seed down, throw a little bit of compost over the top and water it in, move on. And never was there any starter fertilizer applied. And the new lawn would kind of come in kind of spotty, 
kind of a spotty fill-in rate as a result of this poor technique. And I saw it a whole bunch. There was a town that I used to run a nursery in called Fremont, California. And it really had a dark clay-like soil. And holy crap, you know, if it got wet, it held water forever. But if it got dry, it would crack and split. And lawns just went, they just gave up most of the time. This is basically a classic case of laziness or shallow pockets to save a buck and a desire to just get it done approach to a task that requires slightly more effort for long-term success. Okay, maybe not slightly more effort, probably a lot more effort. Healthy, robust lawns have a, a root bed that is inches deep and you attain that through rototilling and amending the existing soil down to that depth prior to doing anything. Achieving a four to six inch tilled lawn bed and properly firm up and rest and settle and have the nutrients and everything and all the, the microorganisms start to, to play off each other in that ground before you put your sod down, that is when you're gonna have a long-term success lawn. That new sod or seed, they're driving their roots deep and maintain a good moisture level as a result of the amendment and the, the softness or the, the loosening of that soil allows those roots to penetrate really fast and really deep really quickly and that's where new lawns both seed and sod just leap awake and they take off very quickly as opposed to sitting there for say a month or more and just kind of like eh, i'll get around to it for me a quality starter fertilizer always helps as well there are folks on both sides of the fertilizer fence and i get it okay but in my experience as a horticulturist and landscape contractor the synthetic starter fertilizers that i used scott's was primarily the one I used, and I'm not, no, I'm not sponsored. Always added a level of success, not achieved if I left it out. So think about that as well. So what kind of soil do you have? Will it determine what course you take as far as renovating that tired, worn out lawn in the summertime, tearing it out or replacing it all together, or changing some other things like your water and mowing habits to suit a more successful outcome? Lawns in hard, compacted, and kind of nutrient deficient soils <laughs> have root systems that are stunted. And when I say stunted, they're probably less root than there is green on top showing. And oftentimes struggle really hard to hold water. And instead, basically just, you watch the water just run off and it never penetrates into the soil and make the water available to these weakened lawns period. You can stand out there with a hose and a beer and you can water it until all of a sudden the sidewalk or the driveway has got water running down it. But it doesn't mean that it is penetrated. It may mean that it got it wet and that top half inch is moist. But then, you know, mother nature and evaporation and other stuff robs about 70% of it, depending on what time you're doing it. And the result, lawns are taken over by weeds that can thrive in such neglected conditions and soon enough they propagate and eventually choke out the desired lawn that you're trying to keep alive and voila nag 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 and you've got that lawn in the neighborhood again so lawn renovation when it comes to the soil situation lawn renovation using power equipment is one solution provided that you're not heavily infested with weeds yet you know taking things and renting power equipment like a lawn aerator to uh, punch holes in that lawn and allow you to clean that off and then come in with a power renovator and really stir up the whole lawn bed all together. You're really gonna disturb that soil a lot. You're gonna clean out all the thatch that may be there. And then once you clean that all off, you can come in with a good organic compost and top dress that, water it down in, and then seed or sod again. And it's almost like a new lawn. I will admit that coming after lawn problems in this fashion can be a really big band-aid. It can. That aerator, depending on the kind of soil you have, is probably only gonna punch down a half inch. So it's better than nothing, but it's not as good as this. Sometimes it's just best to kill the lawn in whatever manner you choose to achieve success whether you spray it or whether you do some solarization or however you want to do it. And then come in, use a sod cutter or your tool of choice and remove the dead lawn, 
prepare that new lawn bed correctly, and then come back and resod or reseed. And with that in mind, would I do it right now? Eh, maybe, yeah, depending, depends. It would depend on a few things like, you know, where you locate it at. What does the weather hold for you until fall comes about? Hint, hint. And what kind of time and resources do you have? Do it on the cheap and in the heat of the summer the wrong way, you're probably gonna end up right back in the same problems within a year. You really will. Lawn soil prep, kind of like painting a house or a room within your house or painting a car is all in the preparation. So consider that. It's the biggest violation homeowners commit when it comes to lawn care if they were responsible or others were responsible for putting that lawn in. Okay, moving to other issues. The number two, the big second place on the podium. Coach, I water that damn lawn every day, sometimes twice a day, and it still never perks up. Maybe a little, maybe a little bit first thing in the morning, but I see the same wilting when I come home from work every afternoon. What the hell am I doing wrong here? You know, my water bill is really getting up there and nothing looks good. Does that sound familiar to you? I certainly have heard that a few hundred times. The only turf I have seen to need watering two times a day in the summer by professionals is bent grass lawns on golf course greens on the fancy golf courses. They'll go out there at dawn and hand water by hose and soak it down and let it get down into that sandy turf bed. And then everybody does their thing on the golf course that day and then they'll come back and do it again at night. But for 99% of all of you residential homeowners out there, you probably don't have bent grass lawns and you don't need to water that twice a day to maintain some semblance of green. That's a key, that's a key component and a big red flag to say, look, there's a problem here. So let's examine three things and a means of diagnosis. We're gonna put on our detective hat one more time. First, determine the moisture level in the wet part of the lawn, and then again in the areas that appear to wilt or struggle. Well, first of all, if the wet areas are, say, wet down at least a half depth of your shovel, if you put that shovel down in there and just kind of pry it a little bit and put your hand down in there and you can tell it's, it's wet and moist, and the part above the ground, the green part, the green is green, we can surmise that adequate moisture is sinking in and doing its job for the turf whether it be you uh, dragging a hose or putting a little hose end sprinkler out there or your sprinkler system, that particular area of the yard is okay. But another thing is if the wet area, if you find that the wet area is wilting anyway, well, now we have other issues besides moisture. And I'm gonna address those in just a second. Now, the dry area is sort of moist on the surface, but within an inch, within an inch, or maybe two, then we can address that in a few ways. And that's probably, you know, it, it does go back to the soil issue. But if you have a sprinkler system, we may very well have a coverage issue, not a amount of water that's being put on the lawn, but where it is being put on the lawn. Go turn your system on if you have a sprinkler system and inspect it while it's in operation. I will bet, I will bet that if you have wilting lawn, with a sprinkler system that's automated, timed correctly, and et cetera, chances are you're gonna find that you have a sprinkler head that's not adjusted correctly, or the time of day you're watering is a little bit off, but you're either gonna have to adjust the existing spray heads to correct this area and allow that area to receive more water, or determine which spray heads are dysfunctional and repair them, or determine if that zone or other zones can be adjusted or added to, to correct the lack of coverage in this wilting and stressed out area. And like I said, it all goes back to the soil. You could have a great sprinkler system, but if you have a crappy lawn bed underneath, bad prep equals bad outcome. Poor soil, poor grading results in summer, you're just gonna have summertime woes when it comes to it. So that's why we always do it right the first time, every single time. Hey, if you're a hose dragger, and no disrespect, <laughs> there's millions of them out there, the water delivery device you use may or may not be getting adequate water into the areas your lawn is showing signs of stress. Maybe it's good for a day, and then it wilts out again right away. And then you just rinse and repeat. 
And eventually some people just throw their hands up in the air and go, F it, I don't know what else to do. And then they, they take the hose over there and they, they deliberately water the area that seems to be struggling and it pops back for a little while. And then you put the, the little tractor hose end thing on it again and, and then it rears its ugly head again. Here's, here's one solution that I use to suggest to people is maybe adjust where the lawn is and eliminate it. Eliminate that area because maybe the place where it's dry all the time is in an area that it would be watering your cars or it would be throwing water out in the street or hitting the house too much. Maybe it's time to eliminate lawn in that area and expand shrub and perennial beds that will be able to tolerate a little more of a dry think about that. Okay, another biggie, another big violation when it comes to summer lawn care, and that is mowing habits. I'll call your attention to a lawn care podcast and video I did, shoot, I think it was back in January, January of 2021, if I recall correctly. And I introduced you to the 412 method mentioned in, in that particular video and podcast. Well, that one stands for mowing once a week, which many people do. But I will tell you, as a matter of fact, even within my own family tree, some do not. Some folks wait even two, even three weeks for one reason or another and get out there at 4 p.m. in 95 plus degree heat and then butcher that lawn from five, six inches tall down to less than an inch with the whole premise in mind that Whew, finally, yeah, I know, I, I got out, I did it. Now I won't have to do this again for a while. But the damage and the stress you put to your lawn doing this is why many lawns just freaking give up. It, they turn it over the weeds and they say, F-O-A-D, peace, I'm out of here. Then that guy syndrome slowly creeps in again. Mowing habits are just as important as water and fertilizing. Mowing heights between June and August really determine the health of your lawn. Average lawn blade heights, you know, the green stuff, the blades, hover or should hover around two to almost four inches in the summertime, not a half inch. That root zone, that root zone that you're exposing with that huge butchering will bake, burn, and stress a lawn really, really fast. Then that short exposed soil root zone area, it, it will just give free license for weeds to germinate and to take hold and eventually multiply and crowd out your desired ornamental grass. Remember, height is really king in the hot months. You want a shorter lawn? Then wait until the cooler months and you can take it down a little bit shorter. Or try a lawn type designed to be short from the get-go. Look into some of the hybridized Bermudas and stuff that thrive with inch and a half height. You know, try that if it's suitable for the area you're in. But if you have cool season grasses like many of us do, like fescues, bluegrass, and ryegrass, keep that lawn tall and neat and not scalped and neat. It really, really boils down to that once a week mowing. Yeah, you're only going to take off less than a third of the entire blade height. Anything more than that, you're asking for trouble during the heat of the summer. Here's an analogy. The analogy would be like taking you in your beachwear attire, taking you, ripping you out of there, and throwing you out into the middle of some 110 degree desert environment and sit there, allow you to sit there for eight hours with no hat, no water, no sunscreen, no protection in any way, shape, or form. How do you think you would be after that shock fest. It's the same thing when you butcher your lawn from six inches to one inch. It's exactly the same thing. Those blades, those lawn blades, those blades of grass, those are the sunscreen to the root zone. They are the hat for that lawn's root zone. It is the food engine, for gosh sakes, to keep that lawn productive and thriving. And it's also the hospital. It's where all the needed nutrients are pulled through that blade, pushed down in that root zone, and reversed with moisture and everything else. And that's what keeps a lawn healthy. So mowing habits are really, really important. And you can see, you can start adding up an accumulative stress situation if you have crappy lawn prep, you have horrible watering habits, you have terrible mowing habits, and then you wonder why your lawn looks like crap in the heat of the summer. 
Okay, let's wrap this up. Back to that wet and wilting situation. Seen it a few times, even in my lawns. I, I have, and I had to take care of it. Many times we look to infestations of the lawn as the probable culprit when it comes to this. There are a few bugs that live in your lawn's root zone all the time. When there are a few here and there is really no big deal because your healthy lawn, you know, fends off the problems that they can really cause. But when these little infestations grow in great numbers, then they can really terrorize a lawn into just submission and sometimes even death. You know, most are grubs from one various lawn moth or another. The moth lays its eggs on the, on the surface of the lawn, generally in the evening or nighttime hours. And then when the egg hatches, they dive down in, the grub dives down into the soil itself, into the root zone, and stays where it's cool. And it grows. And what do you think it feeds on? It feeds on the roots of your lawn, the actual roots the food producing, water take upping little organism part of your lawn. Now, I don't know about you, but even a Rhodes Scholar can deduce that reduced roots or no roots at all can lead to big lawn problems really quickly. Lawn grubs are prone to explode in lawns, especially in the, the heat of summer, that are weak already and the lawn has little natural defense like setting out new roots and bouncing back from a mild infestation. Now, the way you generally correct this is through lawn pesticides mixed with fertilizer. Uh, you can apply a, a course of treatment consisting of pesticide and fertilizer over a yeah, generally about an eight to 10 week period, according to the directions, and you'll generally get good results. Now, if you're all about organic and no chemicals coach and all this other stuff, then you come up with your own solution. The best solution is prevention in the first place. Take care of your lawn in the very get go and you won't get into this weeds and grubs and all this other kind of stuff. The big tell when it comes to this kind of stuff you will see is usually wet lawn, but wilting grass. That's a big key right there. No matter how much water you throw on it, it never bounces back. Why? Because it has no roots underneath that particular part of your lawn. There is no roots to take up the water you're throwing on there. And you're sitting there scratching your head going, what the hell? I just watered this thing last night. Why isn't it popped back? Hmm. Yeah. Go out there at night, take your shovel and dig up a section of lawn and, and look down underneath the thatch layer and into the soil and see if you don't see some grubs. Chances are you probably will. Other infestations include funguses, molds, and even some viruses that can invade and cause havoc to your lawn. And they always seem to explode especially for you people with high heat, high humidity. Uh, they always seem to explode in the summertime. Treatments are available for those as well. Just remember, and what I used to see a lot is people would say, well, if I'm only supposed to put two ounces per gallon, I'm putting four because I got a real bad problem with uh, rust on my bluegrass or whatever. Nah, just, just go with the instructions. It, it's easy and you're not throwing more chemical out there than you have to. Follow those directions, please. To sum up, remember, these issues arise as a result of what? Poor preparation in the beginning, poor water habits, and maybe a poor watering system, poor mowing habits, and a general lack of attentiveness to it. You know, a lawn, just like your peach tree, just like your marigold, just like your swimming pool, just it's, a, it's an organism that needs attention. And if you neglect it, I guarantee you, you will be that guy or that gal that says, hey, what happened to the lawn? Because you basically, you know, forgot about it. Oh yeah, and don't forget about Doggo. Don't forget Doggo and all that he or she brings to the lawn care table as well. I can remember as a designer, I can remember going to people's houses and they would say, so what do you think would look nice? And I'd go, well, I think this and that and that. And they, she goes, well, whatever you do, you know, whatever you do, I, I need some lawn because Fido needs a place to pee and poop. And I would just kind of look at them and go, what? <laughs> hey, but what, what are you gonna do? Hey, fall is around the corner. You know, in about six week time or less, if you need to do a major lawn renovation or replacement, man, mid-September to say early November is a great time to do it. The mid-September, sod and seed, no problem. When you start ebbing towards October and into November, I'd really suggest you do sod but I don't know where you guys are at. And that also depends on where you guys live. I mean, my God, if you're in 
upper Minnesota and you say, hey, I know, I watched, I listened to this guy coach on YouTube or on that podcast he has, and he said I could do it all the way up until the early November. Okay, well, not for upper Minnesota, not for Canada, okay? You guys would be late August and in September. So, common sense. Hey, I hope that this answered some questions. Maybe you have a way of going out and examining it with new glasses on now, having a little more information. I wish you the best of luck when it comes to this. And as always to your landscape success, even during the summertime woes of summertime lawn care. Hey, don't forget to check out the website. I really appreciated the book I sold just yesterday. Thank you very much. And, and that home course, Homescape 1.0, is a great way if you decide to do a landscape project yourself and you need a little more knowledge and education. Thanks for your time, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Yard Coach Podcast. Don't forget to head over to the website at youryardcoach.com where you will find more DIY landscape education, including the free 15-step DIY landscape checklist, Coach Matt's ebook called Landscaping Simplified, and the flagship digital course, Homescape 1.0. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Coach Matt directly at youryardcoach at gmail.com. We'll see you right here next week.